Hello, listeners. Welcome to the Crouching Tiger Hidden Dragon podcast. Today, we have a special guest with us to talk about scaling and growth. So in front of me, I have Zachary Young, and she, he was actually introduced by one of my previous guests, which is Cheyenne Sia. And uh, she was the ADHD coach that you can find in the previous episodes. So a bit about Zachary when we start. So Zachary is actually an accomplished entrepreneur. He's a book author as well. And I'll dive into questions about growth. So Zachary Young is the co-CEO of Next Level Ventures and the founder of Underdog Strategy. And he is also an accomplished author. He has a book on Amazon called The Slingshot Maneuver. So a lot of questions I want to ask about that. So if you don't know Slingshot, I believe maybe I can ask him later as well. But Slingshot in my mind is... Um, more like the David and Goliath story where you have the David shooting Goliath with a slingshot. So the slingshot maneuver has successfully helped multiple small companies to hit their first million dollar revenue year, trigger the start of their exponential business and also to scale beyond eight figures within 12 to 24 months. So today we'd like to welcome Zachary. Zachary, welcome to the show. Hello. Hi, everyone. Yes. Thanks for coming on, Zachary. So for all my guests, I'd like to ask this first question. What is your favorite Kung Fu movie? My favorite Kung Fu movie is Red Cliff, both part one and part two. Yeah, so in, in Chinese, Red Cliff is called Ci Pi yeah. in Chinese. So I love that movie. I love that movie. So a lot, uh, there were other guests that mentioned Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, or mentioned, uh, sorry, mentioned the Romance of the Three Kingdoms, which is one of, in Chinese folklore, the biggest romance novel with strategy, war, love, and Red Cliff um, really portrays that story very well in part one and part two, and has great actors like Tony Leung uh, and uh, a lot of star stars in the two series as well. Um, so I, I especially love the scene uh, that they fought on water. Uh, yeah. So that is a, a very memorable scene. The, fa- the scene where they borrowed the fire, uh, yeah. to the wind and the fire to fight on water. So that is the famous Zhuge Liang story here. So yes, Zachary, thank you for sharing that. That is an excellent choice. So, okay. So Zachary, can you, before I, I ask you questions more, so like, can you tell us more about your journey uh, up till today? My journey, I would say it's a, it's a quite an interesting one because uh, since young, I always wanted to start a business, uh, but I just have no idea what business. And so I was always uh, interested in learning many things, all the things, possible things about business, whether it's in marketing, operations, sales. So I did a little bit of everything. Uh, and then, I, I, in fact, I would think that I discovered my ability to scale and systemize and grow business uh, quite late into my life, actually. I only discovered it uh, around 28, 29 years old. Yeah, so I had a chance to work at a startup. And uh, the great thing about working at a startup is that uh, you do every, practically everything, right? You get to do a bit of marketing. I was hired as a marketing executive. Uh, but eventually, I started doing operations, started doing sales. Uh, then uh, I realized that all the things that I've learned when in my youth, uh, younger days, uh, even I love to play computer games and strategy, all of those things started to uh, come into become useful. So uh, now I just apply game strategy into business and I ended up becoming a business strategist. So after that, around maybe on my 31, 30, uh, on 30, I think 31 years old, I decided to come up and start my own business and consult uh, uh, other businesses using the methods that I've learned. And uh, since then, I managed to, uh, every time I touch a business, uh, uh, managed to help it scale and grow past the seven-figure mark. Uh, some managed even to hit past the 10 million, the eight-figure mark. So um, yeah, that's the story so far. And I've been helping uh, other people do the same thing over and over again. And after a while, I realized that all the startups, I realized my process is uh, kind of... Um, repetitive is always the same few things and then I distilled it into a book which is the slingshot maneuver that you're talking about so yeah that's the journey so far awesome so when you talk about startups is there a specific industry that these startups are in I would say they are normally in either the consulting business um, the information or education business um, in, usually on the internet business but I found that uh, I've I've applied it to a bit of the uh, SaaS uh, sales business as well as well as product business, but it works best for consulting uh, or service-based business, I would say. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Zachary. So yeah, 
Um, that thanks for the clarification. So the first question I would ask you is because I, I have been also a head of growth at a startup, and I also remember my first victories or my first breakthroughs. So being what you are today, what was your first most memorable breakthrough? My first most memorable break breakthrough. Uh, wow, been quite a number of years. Uh, I I think the the first memorable breakthrough. Or maybe I would just say the most memorable breakthrough. Sure, sure. Yeah. Most memorable breakthrough, I, I think it was a case where I was telling this, I, I met my, which is my current uh founder, but this was like three, four years ago. So when I first met him, I his business was a one meal business. Then I was look, I looked at him, I looked at his business, I evaluated, I was like, this could be a easily a multi-million dollar business. Uh, but as with any external uh, consultant, he's like, ah, you're just pulling my leg, trying to get my business, you know, that kind of thing. So I said, you know, no worries. Let, let me consult him on, on things like marketing and all, but I managed to get, help me get good results. So he 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 was like, okay, let's listen to this guy, what he has to say. So um, so I remember I kind of restructured his product, restructured some things. And then we went into, he said, okay, because to, to transform a business is a is a huge risk for most people. So he said, hey, let's 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 do this as a side project at the side first. So last time they used to be, he he said he said this is based in Singapore, but let's test in another country. Let's test in Malaysia. So at Malaysia, he used to sell products at 3,000 ringgit, right? So uh due to the purchasing power difference between Singapore and Malaysia. So so it was reduced price over there at 3,000 ringgit. And he was thinking that, oh, my strategies won't be able to help me scale and things like that. But I was thinking, let's sell it at like uh, uh, 5,000, 10,000, 15,000, and even 50,000 50, ringgit. So they were like, ah, you're not going to get any sales, you know, but there are no worries. I say, just, just trust the system, trust the packaging. We went there, then they were telling us, if you can come back with maybe like 10K worth of sales, I think you did a relatively good job. When we came back, we came back with 150K worth of sales. Then they were like, oh. And they're like, okay, let's do this. Let's do this in Singapore as well. So that was one of the most memorable. It's a kind of a, uh, uh, break all the belief, break all the mindsets. They're like, wow, I didn't know we could do that. And people would buy a 30K, 50K kind of stuff in Malaysia. So, so that was quite a fun, fun, fun story. Thank you for sharing, Zachary. And what do you think was the game changer then? Uh, the game changer was the business model. I think changing the business model, the, the thing is that I didn't change their, I repackaged the product, but the product at the end of the day was the same thing. It was the same education product. However, with a change of the business model, a change of uh, the packaging, right? Um, the way it is uh, presented to, to the customers, to the clients, to the students, uh, suddenly the price points can go up by 10x, even uh, 20x. Yeah, so um, I think the thing that, uh, after, after that, they also reflected as well. I think they realized that technically they didn't sell different things. They just sell sold the same thing in a different form or repackaged version. And uh, yeah, they got 10x uh, and they hit 10 million uh, using this new business model. In, wow. in, a way, would, in a way, I would say it's quite similar to the McDonald's story uh, of Ray Kroc. Like Ray Kroc and the McDonald's brothers, technically he was still selling uh, burgers and all this, but he wasn't making money, right? Until his uh, finance wizard guy went to tell him, actually, you're not in the business of selling burgers. You're in the real estate. So he, he changed the McDonald's uh, business structure, uh, rent out, and then, you know, give them the franchise, everything. And then, uh, yeah, he became super, super rich, Ray Kroc. But same thing, repackage, re-strategize, change our business model, and the results just went up. Awesome. Thank you for sharing. That is an awesome story indeed. And yeah, so next thing I want to ask you is the slingshot maneuver, right? So can you tell us more about that? Oh, the slingshot maneuver. Yeah, so I was saying that uh, because I have to work with uh, consult with many clients, then I always bring through the process of high skill things. And uh, after a while, I realized that uh, I did it the first time. Then the second time, I, I did it again. Then after a while, I realized that I, I keep doing the same things over and over again. And I realized there was a pattern. There was a pattern. So the slingshot maneuver is basically five steps. Uh, the five steps, are, I'll just briefly go through it. It's quite simple. Uh, the first steps, I always tell them to do uh, start off with uh, having a communication channel. Set up anything you want to transform in business, you want to change, you need to have communications with all the key stakeholders, partners, your managers, your leaders. Set up communication channels. After that, what I normally do is that I say that the, the actual way of doing this uh, slingshot maneuver is you set a vision, right? You set a vision, like this is where we're going to go. 
then you find the right people uh, to, to bring them to where you want to go, right? And then after that, you start setting up processes, uh, uh, systems and processes to get there. And then you start checking, uh, creating reports, uh, call number reports, I call them, uh, so that you can check that you're on the right progress. And usually this will get you uh, in that, in, to, to scale the business currently. But for most entrepreneurs, because most entrepreneurs, they don't care so much about how to do things the right way. They want to get results fast. I mean, entrepreneurs, I, I've been there before myself. So most of them, they will do the inverted slingshot maneuver, which is they reverse the order. First, they will start off with the same thing. Everyone has to start off with the communication channels, but they don't care so much about the vision, the people, all this. They care so, more about, okay, let's make sure we get in the sales numbers, get in the, the results. So they'll start tracking the re reports. They'll do the reports, the numbers first. And usually when they do that, they start to realize that, wow, they start to see results already. And then once the results starts coming in, they start to scale up and then they realize that, oh, shucks, a lot of our processes are, are broken or are not happening. So they start fixing their processes, so which is the, the second stage, right? Then after they start fixing the processes and processes are working, then they realize that, hey, uh, our people are giving us some problems, right? Uh, the processes are stable. Some can do it. Some cannot follow the process. Uh, we are not getting the right fit of people. So they started finding the, they started looking to hire good people. And then when they start hiring good people, they realize that good people don't work for any random company. They work for a company with vision. So they realize that, ah, oh, we need to go back to, for the vision. So I call this the inverted uh, slingshot maneuver uh, process because most people, they want to get the money in first. So after they get the money in, then they realize, oh, a lot of things to fix actually. But the proper way, the more sustainable way is actually to first have a business and know your vision and then find the right people, the, the proper way. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And do you have any stories of successful slingshot maneuvers? Um, yeah. So as I was saying, this is uh, the current company that I consulted. And then eventually uh, uh, I consulted them from one meal. Uh, uh, the first time they did one meal in the, their first year, this was before they met me. And then uh, when I, when I, because, okay, prior to them, every time I take on a business, I mean, the trick is also to find the right clients, right? The clients that trust you and all this. Every client I took on, uh, I managed to scale them to usually one meal and beyond. So this client, when I took them on, they were at the one meal mark already. But I was looking at the whole thing. Um, they were they were not optimized. They were not optimized. So I did the slingshot maneuver on them as well. Uh, within the first three months, they hit one meal. So they were like, man, this guy took us to one meal in three months when I took 12 months previously, one entire year to hit one meal. Then in the fourth month, they hit their second meal. Then on the fifth month, they hit their third meal. Then by the time we were on the sixth month, number six, which was June, uh, they were at the five meal mark. And then in December, they they just completed the whole thing. So it was 10 meal. So that was that was uh, growing from one meal in one year to 10 meal in one year. And then, uh, in fact, they grew so fast that the second year, they were expecting even more magic from me. And that was when they asked me to join them to be their CEO. But I told them, uh, hang on, so you all grow so fast, let's consolidate a bit first. So the second year, we continued to, we say, let's work on all the systems, you know. Uh, we kept them at 10 mil, and then the third year, we went for the next growth, and that brought us to a healthy 17 mil or so. So, so yeah, I mean, this is really the story of how a startup within three, four years hit the 17 mil revenue mark. Uh, fun, fun story, yeah. Yeah, thank you for sharing. And yeah, so your, your company also is called the under uh the underdog strategy, right? So yes. like what what makes you want to help underdogs? Uh yeah, I guess uh um when I first come up to consult, right? I could choose to consult MNCs or consult uh, SMEs. And uh, I chose SMEs instead because uh previously when even when I was helping other clients with my previous company. I realized that SME uh, companies, the, the underdog size, so, so called, they are more, they are more practical. They they have a need, right? If they have to feed their customers, uh, they, they feed their teams, they are the owners, they are very uh, motivated to get things done. As compared to SMEs, right? The bigger companies, they're like, oh, this idea, uh, let me go ask my committee, let me go ask my team, let me go ask, you know, they have a go through a lot of layers. But for SME owners, you know, they just have to make it happen. They have to they have to take the action. So a lot of things I tell them, let's do this. Uh, they take the action very fast. Number one, they're motivated. And number two is that 
uh, for consulting, what happens is that your value also comes from the results you bring, right? And if it's with a bigger organization, it trickles in slowly, the results doesn't come as fast or there might be five, 10 other things that's happening behind, behind the scenes. But over here at uh, the, when you're helping a small company, when you make the move, the right move, immediately you see the results. And if the move is a wrong move, uh, of course, you also see nothing happen. So things happen faster, uh, more efficiently, and yeah, because the people are more motivated and more driven. So I, I love working with uh, SMEs and, and the underdogs because uh, eventually all the small companies, they start growing and, and they become the SME eventually. So I, I prefer uh, working with the small underdogs. Give them a fighting chance. Yeah, I, that is that is good. Uh, that's a good way to put it. And a lot of uh, my audience are running these uh, underdog businesses. So when it, when you help these underdog companies, you mentioned just now the reverse <laughs> slingshot maneuver, right? So what other common mistakes do, do they make? I, I would say uh, usually, usually uh, most of the most common mistakes is uh, I think speed. Because I mean, I, I mean, I'm an entrepreneur myself as well and managing a growing company. Always people like to grow at all costs. So sometimes uh, we will make moves that in the short run, it's, uh, it, it pays, right? Uh, maybe we just hire this person because um, it's, uh, it's uh, like we just need to fix this problem right now. But the thing is that um, eventually if you hire the wrong person, yes, the person might help you bring in some money, bring in the, you know, especially people with the wrong culture fit. Yeah, they'll bring in the sales, they bring in, but in the long run, it will hurt your your organization, especially when you start to build the team, you start to put people under this person and then you realize this person may not be a good fit or may not be your a good fit for a company culture or do not have the same vision as you, right? They end up this person, but this person can get results and then you normally have to make a painful choice of whether to let this person go and restart again or, or uh, yeah, like how, what's going to happen next. So I, I think uh, sometimes we sacrifice, we don't think that long-term uh, for, we sacrifice some of the long-term things for short-term results and uh, we suffer for it. So I, I think this is one of the most, most common uh, scaling mistakes uh, people make. Yeah. Yeah, sacrificing short-term results for uh yeah, long-term results, short -term yeah. results for short-term short -term gain. Yeah. yeah, yeah, amazing. So yeah, you mentioned that you work with a lot of these educational or consulting businesses. Mm -hmm. So is is your approach? Does it have to involve advertising most of the time? Mm, I would say uh, advertising is the fastest way to scale something mm -hmm. because um once you know. Uh, the funnel works, right? Once I, every $1 I put in, I get $5. Then obviously to scale it, I'll just put in $5 and get $25 back and, and I'll just repeat the process. I mean, obviously, the more money you put in, eventually the um, the return on the ad spend will start to drop. Uh, but generally, this is the fastest way to scale. There are also organic ways to scale, but I would say that the process works. Uh, this is in terms of scaling, but it doesn't always have to be for marketing base or it doesn't have to be for uh, advertising with uh, digital advertising related stuff because I think the slingshot maneuver works because of tracking of numbers. Tracking of numbers, right, allows you to, if your, your company has a, your, your, com your entire sales funnel, right, from starting, getting the lead all the way to the sales, the ending of sales, if you do track your numbers, you'll find to, very quickly you'll realize that there are some parts that gives you uh, unfair advantage. There are some parts that I, I call them, maybe they, is it pivots or fulcrum, right? Just mm. small adjustment there, right? Will completely give you a lot of leverage on your business. So by tracking your numbers, maybe it's your lead generation, maybe it's your sales conversion, maybe it's the number of appointments you meet, maybe it's the amount of sales you per transacted, things like that, right? If you find the one that is your bottleneck, which is the purpose of the slingshot maneuver, tracking the numbers, you find that this is your main bottleneck, just switching this bottleneck or make, making a move to switch this will give you exponential returns. So I think the slingshot maneuver, more than just about marketing or more about like just education business or what, it's about helping people to identify their business I funnel the, the key bottleneck. Yeah, and that's where you can make the most difference in someone's business. Yeah, that is that is good. That is a very good insight over there. So like you say, you have to track the numbers. Mm -hmm. um, so we have heard all your victories today. <laughs> so I think the, the other question my audience would ask is, do you have any losses or any mm -hmm. failures and what do you learn from it? 
<laughs> definitely, there's definitely failures and losses. I think, um, thankfully, there isn't any critical, like, like uh, uh, I think battles definitely have lost some battles. Uh, thankfully, no uh, damaging wars that I've lost. But I think uh, one of them was, uh, from, I, maybe I can share like one or two. Uh, one of them was probably like, when you hire, you're like, like I mentioned, right? You just want, most people make the same mistake of just looking for, uh, when you're growing a business so fast, the business grows so fast that you need to find people. So sometimes you find the wrong person or you, you, um, you, you, you sacrifice the, your long-term objectives for short-term things. Then as a result, it gives you a lot of pain. Thankfully, sometimes you can undo it. You can remove the person. You know, the person can find a better job elsewhere, but you have to spend a few months <laughs> undoing some stuff. Uh, losses, uh, I think uh, another uh, interesting loss is probably uh, using the correct business model, the proven business model uh, uh, on the wrong season or wrong trend. So there are trends that I've realized in the market no matter how good a business strategy or business model is, when the trend is gone, the trend is gone. You know, if you fight that uh, trend, let's say it's a sunset industry or a, a trend, right? You are, it's very hard for you to turn it around. Yeah. So, so um, uh, let me give you an example. Let's say, for example, uh, there's a topic. Let's, uh, let's say, for example, if right now, no matter how good a strategist I am, I don't think I can revive the CD business. <laughs> All right. So that's obviously, uh, it's gone. It's passe already. So I, I think it's really picking your clients, picking the trend, knowing the trend uh, uh, is super, super important. I think that's one, I mean that and some other lessons I've learned, but that's probably one of the most important lessons I learned in business. Don't fight the trend. Oh my God, that is, that is, uh... That is so gold, right? So don't fight the trend. And uh, do you think they should write the, the trends as well? I think uh, writing the trend is, is definitely one of the things to do. Um, uh, but it also depends what kind of business um, uh, you are. So I think for the smaller businesses, writing the trend, especially in the world of marketing, in the world of training, is, yeah, if you can write a trend, one meal or so is super easy. But I think the tricky thing is not about making one meal worth of business, but sustaining it. Uh, if you want to sustain it, I hope you find a trend or something that is a bit more evergreen. Uh, things like, we realize things like health, topics like health, wealth, relationships, this kind of business, generally uh, relatively evergreen. Yeah, the topics may change. I know, like sometimes there's crypto boom, sometimes there's NFTs, then sometimes there isn't. You know, if you go and write on the off trend, then good luck to you. But if you pick the right industry, the right topics, the right products, the right businesses, you will usually uh, uh, write, you can write the trend for quite a long because trends can actually go on for quite some, some, some time. Yeah. Yeah, that is that is good. That is a long term planning there. So thank you so much for for sharing. So one of the things that you mentioned earlier in this podcast is that you started off playing games, and mm. then uh, games really influence what you are today. So what games you used to play, and what you learned from these games? Oh, uh, games I play. Uh, I play. I would say I play strategy games. So I play like things like StarCraft, uh, Command and Conquer, Red Alert. Uh, actually, I play a lot of games, Chinese chess, all strategy games, right? Uh, and uh, I think one last game I like to add into the mix is uh, fantasy football. <laughs> I mean, yeah. So, so after that, I mean, number one, I never thought of myself as a numbers person. I mean, I love to play games, right? I don't like to. I'm I'm decent at math, but I don't like to do math. But when you start playing um, StarCraft. Real alert, uh, all these strategy games, even fantasy things. You start fantasy, uh, football, right? You start to realize that you have to cut, start looking at the numbers. You start looking at trends. You start going to the details. A lot becomes uh resource allocation, right? Starcraft, you got a limited amount of time, a limited of starting resources. You have to make decisions, uh, allocation of resources. Same thing as fantasy football. They will give you a certain amount of money to buy and you have to buy and sell, you have to get the max best players and things like that. So a lot of this strategy, I feel it's a resource allocation as well. I mean, knowing the trend, then you manage your, arrange your resources according to, to, to maximize that trend. So um, I, I would say those are the games that I play and I learned a lot of resource allocation skills from, from that 
uh, from those co those computer games, those those games, and uh, I brought it over to my business, which is a resource allocation, time allocation, uh, money allocating your money, allocating your manpower, uh, uh, choosing which projects to pursue. Um, all of those have really helped me tremendously in the business. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So uh, funny that you mentioned StarCraft Red Alert. So this, these games, uh, like you said, strat, um, resource allotment, you know, hum, human resource allotment. So uh, it, you need to have a short-term game plan. You need to survive the game. And then you also need a long-term. There is yeah. beginning game, mid game, and end game strategy as well. So yeah, interesting insights there. Thank you so much for sharing. So we are almost at the end now. So last question for you is like, what's, what is next? <laughs> so what's next? And uh, what are your plans for the future? I see. So the next is, um, so we are in a stage of growing and scaling. So we, I mean, I, I also told my founder uh, that we grew from, you know, 1 mil to 10 mil, 10 mil to 17 mil, 17 mil. I mean, the next thing we are aiming for it's uh it's like how do we get to the hundred million mark and uh, even list our company at a billion dollar valuation, and what's next? I we realized that what got us here will not get us there, right? So we must be very humble to relearn and unlearn many of our things because every business model does have their own uh, limitations. So once the one of the new things I did was to I I mean start a start a entrepreneurship club, uh, which is what I call the Diamond Business Club. So so this Diamond Business Club is is where I actually pull in a lot of uh, entrepreneurs, business people who are at our same level or even higher level than us. And then we really see how they do their business. So it has it has been blowing a lot of, a lot of uh, mindsets for me and hanging out with them, they think on a very different level. These are people who, uh, I just met a guy uh, who owns an island, a guy, another guy who bought a tower, uh, then a guy who manages a $52 billion fund. So, so these people think on a different level. So to go to the next level, even for myself and for the company, we realized that we've got to hang around this group of people and, and constantly, you know, so, so what's next for me uh, is just really uh, building a bigger network of this kind of crazy entrepreneurs, crazy business people, this very, very high level people hang around, learn their businesses, uh, learn their business model, learn how they think, and also hoping to apply and to transform our own business so that we can also uh, go for that 100 million uh, revenue and uh, $1 billion valuation. So that's the plan for us. Thank you, Zachary. That was awesome. Yeah, so thank you so much for being on the show. It's a rather short episode, but because you were very good with your answers, very succinct. <laughs> I had, it's, don't get me wrong, I, I pushed a lot, of, a, a lot of questions here today, but you answered in a very short and also informative matter. So thank you so much for being on the show. Glad to be here. Hope, hope, hope it helps you and hope it helps your, your audience um, to scale and grow their business for the underdogs. <laughs> thank you so much.